Welcome back everyone. Uh, in this lecture, I will continue with the properties of cyclic groups. So, first let us recall what we have done so far. So, we proved uh, a very important classification theorem of cyclic groups. So, if G is cyclic, so depending upon the order of G, then we proved that either G is isomorphic to uh, the group of integers or G is is isomorphic to EZ modulo NZ. Okay, so this is the first result that we proved, and the second result, if uh, G is isomorphic to EZ or R of G is infinite, so then there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the subgroups of G and the natural numbers non negative integers okay and we also proved that if uh, g has order finite and it is exactly capital n then the subgroups of g has one to one correspondence with those devices of n okay so this is something uh, we already proved so now we will actually ask a very fundamental question that if you fix a cyclic group then how many generators are there okay for example let's start with integers so then we already seen that if this integers is generated by some n then if and only if this n must be plus or minus 1 so the similar similar thing must be happening even for infinite uh, cyclic group Okay, if G is uh, infinite cyclic group, so and G is generated by X, so then you can prove that, so G is generated by some X power A if and only if A is plus or minus 1. So this is something I will leave it as exercise because this is something we have proved already for integers. So now what will happen to finite uh, cyclic group okay let us start with uh, uh, finite cyclic group okay so let us take g which is cyclic and order of g is capital n which is finite so then it makes sense to actually count the number of generators of g because g itself is finite so the number of generators also must be finite okay and that is well defined uh, number for given g so let's call it that is n of g Okay, this is the number of generators of G. Okay. So, since uh, once you fix the order and uh, all uh, cyclic groups of order n, they are all isomorphic, then under isomorphism, it is easy to see that generator must be mapped to generator. So, that I will leave it as exercise. If you have an isomorphism between g and g dash and if x is generator of g okay and g generated by x so then you can prove that g dash is also generated by the image of x okay and vice versa you can also start with the generator of g dash and then you can actually get phi inverse of that element and that will generate g so in particularly there is a one to one correspondence between the generators of G and uh, generators of G dash. Okay. So, this is another exercise. So, there is so one to one correspondence between the generators of G and G dash. Okay. So, this is one, this is maybe two. So now, uh, because of this, uh, since there is a unique uh, group z mod n z up to isomorphism, okay. So, so this problem is actually exactly counting the number of generators of z modulo n z. So let us see what happens to that. So, if you take g to be n n z, okay. So what we proved so far, let's recall, if g is generated by x and order of x equal to n 
then we also proved that order of x power a is nothing but order of x divided by gcd of order of x comma a okay so in particularly x power a generates g if and only if order of x power a must be equal to order of x okay but that is if and only if gcd of order of x comma a must be 1 okay so any element of g must be power of x so then this last characterization actually kind of gives you how to get all possible generators of g so the generators of g is indeed g is those powers of x such that so you can take a to be between 1 to n minus 1 and gcd of order of x comma a is 1 okay but easily you can see that this has 1 to 1 correspondence between those integers from 1 to n minus 1 such that gcd of order of x comma a is 1 so the number of such things is given by this Euler phi function so this is exactly phi of n okay so Euler phi function basically counts such numbers so those a such that a is between 1 to n minus 1 and gcd of a comma n is 1 okay so now uh, this actually kind of uh, motivates us for the following important question like how do you compute this phi of n okay so phi of n actually gives you the number of generators of g that is fine or number of the generators in z modulo n z but is there any way to compute this uh, phi of n so it is easy to see that what will be phi of 1 so phi of 1 by definition it is just 1 okay so because there is exactly one generator so maybe you can allow here maybe n so that uh, there won't be an issue okay if n is greater than 1 you can take it to be n minus 1 but when to include to include uh, 1 you can take it to be it's between 1 and n so now uh, what will be phi of 2 so phi of 2 if you think about it so how many numbers are there like uh, between 1 and 2 which is relatively prime to 2 is just 1 so what is phi of 3 phi of 3 is just 1 2 3 so 3 is not relatively prime and 1 and 2 are relatively prime so it is just 2 okay so phi of 4 you can see that it is 1 2 3 4 so 2 is not there 4 is not there it is again 2 phi of 5 is 1 2 3 4 5 uh, all are relatively prime okay except 5 so it is 4 so it is easy to see that phi of any prime p must be p minus 1 for prime p okay because all the numbers that are below p 1 to p minus 1 they are relatively prime with p so what happens to for example phi of p square okay so you are trying to count those integers from 1 to p square which are relatively term relatively prime to p so if you think about it if d and p square they are not relatively prime then p must divide d okay if d and p square the gcd of this is greater than 1 if and only if p must divide d because the only devices of p square is are 1 p and p square okay and if you take d from okay less than p square minus 1 so then this is what happens okay so then how do you count this so here is the way to count so for example you can list them 1 2 etc p and then uh, p plus 1 p plus 2 etc p plus 2 p okay which is uh, uh, 
sorry let's uh, do it in some other way so i want to count it up to p square so we take it to be so here p minus 1 p and then you add p minus 1 plus p and then here 2p and then if you keep doing this so you will get here p square and then here p square minus 1 okay and then here you get p minus 1 times p plus 1 so you can list all the numbers like this and then you can see that the only numbers that will have some p as divisor is these numbers the last column numbers p 2p 3p all of them must be having uh, p as divisor so that means you can take all these numbers okay they are all relatively prime with p square so how many numbers are there so each row has p minus 1 and then how many columns are there you can see that it is exactly starting with 0 and then you are going up to uh, p power uh, p minus 1 plus p minus 1 plus 1 okay because this is the one you are going so this is 0 times p and then 1 times p equal to p and this is the thing you are going so basically it's exactly p minus 1 plus 1 this is the number of rows okay and the number of columns exactly only in the red okay that is p minus 1 so the total number is exactly p minus 1 times p which is p into p minus 1 so basically this cardinality of p of p square is p into p minus 1 in other way it is p square minus p so you have totally p square number of elements and then you have to delete those integer which are multiple of p those integers which are multiple of p exactly lies in the last column so that is you can say now if you generalize this proof you can easily prove that phi of p power any r is nothing but p power r minus p power r minus 1 okay so you can see that 1 to p power r there are p power r numbers and uh, you have to actually delete those numbers which are multiple of p okay then you can easily see that there are p power r minus 1 numbers which are multiple of p namely p 2p 3p and so on up to p power r minus 1 times p okay those these are all the numbers that you are supposed to delete okay so that means you have exactly p power r minus p power r minus 1 numbers which are relatively prime to p power r so now if you are interested in computing uh, other numbers which are let's say composite numbers so what one can do so we one can use this formula so phi of mn will be exactly equal to phi of m times phi of n whenever the gcd of mn is 1 so there are many ways actually one can prove this let us give group theory proof okay so we know that uh, given any cyclic group of order n the number of generators in that group is exactly phi n okay so in particularly if i take a subgroup okay of order d if you take h is subgroup of g and order of h is d so then you can see that the number of generators of h okay so those are all so because there exists unique subgroup of order d so any generate any element of order d must lie inside this subgroup okay and so the number of uh, elements of g of order d will become exactly the number of 
generators of H. Okay, because there exists unique subgroup of order D. That is something we have already proved. So now this is somewhat helps us uh, to actually understand what will happen to this phi of M n. Okay, so phi of M n definitely count the number of generators of the group that has order M n. So start with the group which has order M n. Okay, for example, Z modulo M n Z. You can take this. So this is as your example. So this is your G. So now what happens? The number of generators of G is equal to phi of M n. Okay, that is very clear. So now what we are going to do? We are actually going to say that these generators can be obtained in some specific way so that this number exactly becomes equal to the product of this m phi of m and phi of m. So let us see what we can do. Okay, start with the generator, call it x. Okay. So now since this m n they are relatively prime, so then you have some a and then b such that a m plus b n is identity where a b are integers such that this happens because m and n are relatively prime. Okay, in particularly what we can do we can see that this x is nothing but x power m times a times x power n times b. So you can write it this way. Okay. So now you can call this is y and then you can call this is z. So we claim that the order of y must be n and then order of z must be y. So what is our claim? The claim is order of y must be n and order of z must be m. So basically what we have done, okay, if you think about it, so you have written x as some y z namely x power m a y power n b. Okay, this is my y, this is my z and we are claiming order of y is n and order of x order of z is n. Yeah. Okay. So let us verify this. Okay. So y order of y is n. Okay. If you take uh, y power n then this is exactly x power m power a power n. So then you can see that this is x power m and a which is identity because order of x is m n. So that will imply that order of y divides n. Okay. So now we want to say order of y is equal to n. So how to say this? Okay. So now if you start with some other power y power k is identity, y power k is identity then that would imply that x power m a k is identity and that would imply that m n divides m a k. Okay. But go back to your a, your a is satisfying this a m plus b n equal to 1. So that means a comma n is also the GCD is 1 because a is here n is here. So a and n are must be relatively prime. If there is a divisor of a and n then that must to divide n divide 1. So that means the GCD of a and n must be 1. So then what you can do you can see that from this n divides a k and a and n are relatively prime. So that will imply that n divides k. We already shown that order of y divides n. If you take this k to be your order of y, so then you have seen that n also divides k. So that proves that k is equal to order of y equal to n. So similar argument shows that order of z is also m. Okay. So basically you have written this x as 
product of two elements y z such that this r of y is n and r of z is m and we will claim that this is actually a unique expression. So, there are no this is the only way you can actually split them into product of two elements ok. So, suppose if you have other splitting so let us say x equal to y z and then y 1 z 1 such that order of y 1 is n and order of z 1 is m. So, then this should imply y equal to y 1 and z equal to z 1. So, this is our another claim. So, basically given x we are saying that there exists unique tuple y comma z such that y x equal to y z and order of y equal to n and order of z is m. Okay, how to prove this? You can see that y z equal to y 1 z 1 implies y 1 inverse y 1 equal to z 1 inverse z 1 sorry z 1 inverse z. Okay, now, you can see that order of this element actually must divide n order of this element must divide m, but both m and n are lately prime. So, that means order of this element must divide call this element some, some uh, u. You can see that order of u must divide m and order of u must divide n, but both m and n are lately prime that implies order of u divides 1 that implies u is identity. If u is identity that would imply y 1 equal to y okay, and z 1 equal to z. So, that proves the uniqueness. So, let us summarize what we proved. If g is generated by x okay, then there exists unique tuple y z such that x equal to y z and order of y equal to n order of z equal to m. So, this is what we prove ok. So, so now any generator can be written as product of two elements and one has order n and one has order m. So, this is unique. So, that means if you are interested in counting such x then it is enough to count the number of y's that has order n and number of z that has order m okay the product of them so why okay so let's see so so the number of the the set of generators of g is now has bijective correspondence are equal to i can say y z where y and z are coming from g such that order of y equal to n and order of z equal to m. So, the correspondence is given by x goes to y z. So, now given this tuple y z it is easy to see that the order of y z must be m n okay, that is also something we have proved already because they are relatively prime m n. So, this is actually gives one to one correspondence. So, but how many elements are here? You, you already if you go back to our observation the number of elements of order d okay, this is the observation that we already made. So, if you have a cyclic group order of g equal to n g is cyclic number of elements of order d is exactly equal to phi of d because it is exactly the number of generators of that unique subgroup of order d ok. So, in particularly for this y you have exactly phi of m choice phi of n choices for this z you have exactly phi of m choices. So, the cardinality of this equal to so this cardinality is equal to phi of n times phi of n but this cardinality is exactly phi of m n. So, both must be equal ok. So, if you want to actually uh, tell you more uh, uh, into like uh, in group theory language basically what we proved, we proved isomorphism between two groups ok. One is z modulo m n z, another one is z modulo m z 
cross Z modulo N H L. Okay. So, there is a natural isomorphism between these two groups and as I said the isomorphism always preserves the number of generators. So, the number of generators here is exactly phi of M n and the number of generators here is basically product of the number of generators. So, that is just phi of M times phi of N. So, this is what we indeed proved. Okay. But still I have not introduced what is direct product. So, we will actually introduce. So, basically this isomorphism tells you that phi of M n is exactly equal to phi of N times phi of M. Okay. So, now uh, we are indeed uh, ready to actually uh, state and prove our characterization of cyclic groups. So, recall so far what we have done okay, that is what gives us characterization. So, the following are equivalent. Let G be a group. Let us start with finite group okay. and assume that R of G is capital N. So, then the following are equivalent. One is G being cyclic and second is so given for all D divides N there exist unique subgroup of order D in G. The third thing is for all D divides N there are exactly phi of D elements of G of order D. Okay. The fourth thing is for all D device N there exist at most phi of D elements of G of order D and fifth one is for all D device N there exist at most one subgroup of G of order. Okay. So, I will actually prove uh, 1, 2 and 5 are equivalent. I will leave other things are uh, exercise. Okay. Basically, it uses the same arguments. Okay. So, note that uh, if G is cyclic, we proved that there exists unique subgroup of order D in G for all device D in N. So, since any element of order D must lie in this subgroup, so and this subgroup must have exactly phi of D generators. So, there exists, there are exactly phi of D elements of uh, G of order D. Okay. So, 2 in plus 3 will be easy and 3 in plus 4 again is easy because if there are exactly phi of D, then there are at most phi of D. So, now 4 in plus 5 is also easy because if there are at most phi of D elements, either the subgroup exists or do not exist. If it exists, uh, then it has to be at most 1 because then that subgroup is again cyclic. Okay. Sorry, that subgroup uh, can have uh, I guess yeah, it cannot have 2 subgroup of order D, maybe like 4 in place 3 you can take it as success. Okay, let us see like before proving this uh, uh, what uh, information that we get about cyclic group and then that is what used in the proof. So, if you start with G which is cyclic group of order N okay, which is isomorphic to this. So, then there are two ways to count the number of elements in G. Okay, the number of elements in G can be partitioned into the following sets following this joint says D that A D where D device N. We have already seen that if you take some element of G okay, so that has to be of the form x power A then the order of that x power A should be order of x divided by G C D of order of x comma A. So, in particularly order of that x power A divides order of x. Okay. So, that is why it will be inside one of this A D. What is A D? A D those elements y in G such that order of y exactly equal to D. So, each element 
has some order and that order definitely divides n so that given any element should be in ad and because the orders definitely partitions the elements okay one element cannot have two different order so this is a partition of your group g now what this partition indeed says so it says on the right side you have the cardinality of g on the left side you have the cardinality of ad d divides n but we have already seen what is the cardinality of ad the number of elements that has order d is exactly phi of d so basically this says the summation phi of d d divides n is exactly n so this is some number theory identity that we get it for free by understanding the number of generators in the cyclic group so the number of elements is exactly given by summation phi d d divides n so this is what used in the proof also so let us go through the proof as i promised i will prove 1 implies 2 2 implies 5 1 implies 2 i already proved given any divisor d there exists unique subgroup of order d so now 2 implies 5 is obvious okay if there exists unique subgroup then for given d there will be at most one subgroup either group is there or not there now you assume 5 so only the non trivial thing is 5 implies 1 5 implies 1 so g has the property that given any divisor d of n there exist at most one subgroup of g of order d okay so this is what they so now we want to prove that g must be cyclic to prove g cyclic it is enough to prove a capital n is non empty okay this a capital n we have already uh, seen this is non empty if and only if g is cyclic so we indeed prove this okay this is our claim we will prove that a is non empty so this is what we prove okay so how do we prove this so look at g and given any element it will have some order okay so definitely you can write g as union ad d divisive n okay so what is ad again recall ad is those elements x and g maybe i will call it again y such that order of y is d okay okay so here uh, yeah maybe i am uh, i still uh, yeah so i don't need to use lagrange theorem i was wondering whether i will use lagrange theorem so it's not needed so because so the way we it's given g has the property that given any divisor there exist at most one subgroup of order d okay so now uh, if i start with some element okay of order d so then uh, i guess it uses lagrange's theorem okay so so let me state the lagrange's theorem here okay it's one of the consequences of lagrange's theorem if g is some abstract group and x is an element of g okay and the order of x is finite and again you assume that order of g is also finite then order of x must divide order of g okay so this is something we will prove later but now from this it's clear that if you have some element in g such that order of that element is d then d must divide n so so this equality makes sense okay so because we want to restrict d only for the divisors of capital n so now uh, given x it must be in one of this ad but if i fix this ad okay suppose ad is non empty so that mean there exists some y in ad but order of this y is d so now if you take this subgroup generated by y 
the cardinality of this must be d. But what our hypothesis says? Our hypothesis says there exist at most one subgroup of adage. So that means this A D must be contained in this subgroup generated by Y because if I start with any other element Y dash in A D that also will have order D and then if you look at this subgroup generated by Y dash that also uh, that must be same as the subgroup generated by Y because there exists at most one subgroup. So that forces that this A D is subset of the subgroup generated by Y. But how many elements are there of order D inside this cyclic group generated by Y? There are exactly phi of D elements. Okay? So that tells us that the cardinality of A D is exactly phi of D if A D is non-empty. Okay? So that tells you that from this equality, okay, call it star. So from star you get from star you get the cardinality of G which is capital N is exactly equal to summation the cardinality of AD D divides N. But this AD the cardinality is exactly phi of D if AD is non-empty. So this is less than or equal to because some of the AD could be empty we do not know. Okay? So, this is exactly equal to summation phi of d, d divides by n. But note that this is exactly equal to n. That is what we already observed by applying our analysis for the group z modulo n z. So, if we take z modulo n z using the, our understanding, we are proved that n is equal to summation phi d, d divided by n. So, that means here you have n less than or equal to sorry equal to this which is less than or equal to n. Since equality of this left hand side is same as right hand side that forces that the equality happens in the middle as well. So that means so this uh, summation d divided n mod a d should be exactly equal to summation phi of d d divided n. Since all of them are non-negative integers so that forces they are actually positive integers that forces that the cardinality of AD must be equal to phi D for all D divides N. In particularly you can take D equal to N that forces that the cardinality of AN is exactly phi N. Okay, that means AN is non-empty because phi N is at least 1. Okay. So now we have proved that AN is non-empty but that is what we wanted to prove. AN is non-empty implies G is cycling. So that means if G has the G is a finite group has the property that given any divisor D of, D of the order of G there exists at most one subgroup of order G of order D. So then that G must be cyclic. Okay? It is a very very important uh, consequence. So let us uh, let me stop with one important corollary. So if you know what is a field okay, if F is a field. So then if you take the multiplicity group those are all non-zero elements in X uh, in F. Okay. So that will form a group for example C star you can take. So any finite subgroup of this field uh, so multiplicity group F, F cross must be cyclic. So any finite subgroup G must be cyclic. For example, you can take F to be complex numbers okay, and any finite subgroup of C cross must be cyclic that is what we are proving. Why it is the case? You take the cardinality of G to be capital N. Okay. Then again you have to use uh, Lagrange's theorem. Okay. If D divides N, okay, then if you look at the subgroup of order D. Okay. Suppose H is a subgroup of G of order D then you can prove that this H must be those X inside F cross. Okay. 
so maybe I will put it like this way those x in g such that x power d equal to 1 okay and for x power d equal to 1 there are only exactly d solutions in a at most d solution in a field okay so that means so it's a, it that h has only the uh, d roots of unity okay at most so that means either h exists or h is exactly equal to those x in f cross such that x power d equal to 1 so that means it is the group either exists or it is the unique group given by this okay so this again uses lagrange theorem maybe after introducing the lagrange theorem i will come back to this we will come back to this okay i'll stop here uh, so we'll continue next class uh, with the homomorphisms and uh, some basic properties of homomorphisms